see how a few Malaysia city volunteers help family members of those on the missing plane. We find out if Taiwan has learned a lesson following Japan's Fukushima nuclear disaster three years ago. Welcome to Dia Headlines, I'm Wendy Chen, thank you for joining us. First up in Malaysia, we join city volunteers in Kuala Lumpur and Kedah as they continue to care for family members of those on board the missing flight MH317. Frantically waiting to hear from her son Yu Yunhen, Yu's mother hasn't been able to get a solid night's rest in days. I can't eat and I can't sleep. You have to, you have to eat something. 41-year-old Yu Yunheng often travels to China for business, but this was his first time traveling to Beijing. Before boarding the flight, he even called his mother to confirm his safety. He called me before he got on the plane. He said he would call once he arrives in Beijing. Days have gone by and that phone call has still not come. Today, his son's friend, also a city volunteer, Guo Shouchen, is visiting the family with 11 other volunteers, bringing their support and deepest blessings. We have to take care of ourselves. We will wait for him and pray that he will come home soon. So you need to look after yourself and to your health too. We used to play together when we were little. I know his entire family. This incident is really heartbreaking. City volunteers lead the Yu family in prayer as they pray for good news and for the family to be reunited once again. Seeing familiar faces once again, both seniors finally break into smiles. Volunteers have returned to check on the seniors' health and well-being. When her son is asking for his mother, it just breaks my heart, but there's nothing we can do except to be strong. Accompanying the volunteers is the family's pediatrician and team doctor Chen Cheng Hung. The children's mother, who was a flight attendant on board the missing MH370, had just taken her children for a consultation with Chen before she left. It happened so suddenly, I can imagine what they are going through. This situation must be very difficult for them to accept. Just like the master said, life is full of impermanence. Chen checks on the senior's health condition and measures their blood pressure. Although just a standard checkup, it provided much needed comfort for the two seniors. You have to love yourself. If you don't love yourself, how will you be able to take care of others? Your blood pressure is not that high, just a little. Once again, the grandma is all smiles as the volunteer's care has helped to soothe her anxious heart. And here at the Dyer Kindergarten, teachers and students pray for blessings for the family. We have to become that source of stability for the families. What we can do is inspire the compassion within those around us. A student draws a picture of a plane with words of blessings on it. This genuine and heartfelt wish is also the hope of all the families of the missing passengers as they wait to receive some news in the days to come. Staying in Malaysia, we meet city volunteers Sun Sun Ji and Dian Tzu Lu to see what they have been doing following the missing jet incident to help. Walking quickly towards his car, this is Malaysia City Volunteer Zheng Shunji. I moved to England in 2001 and lived there for 11 years. Later on, I moved to Ireland and lived there for about 10 months. Zheng Shunji is not only the first city volunteer in Ireland, but also an experienced volunteer who was involved in city's international relief missions in countries such as Sri Lanka and Jordan. Following the news of the missing plane, Zheng quickly traveled to Beijing to offer support to family members. Relief distributions are normally held following natural disasters. In Jordan, Syrians became refugees because of a man-made disaster. At least the refugees knew why they became refugees. However, in China, family members of the passengers on board the missing jet have not received any information. They are very worried and emotionally unstable. We know exactly how they feel right now. 
Knowing what these family members are going through, Jen says he needs to be strong for them despite his own emotions. For me personally, it is very hard. I feel very sad too, but I know that I cannot cry in front of these family members. Life is full of impermanence. We can't predict what is going to happen next. Good morning. Hello, Mr. Zhao. Hey. Hello, Mr. Zhao. Good morning. Following news of the missing Malaysian jet, Kuala Lumpur and Taipei City volunteers have been conducting telephone conference sessions every morning. On March 8, City Kuala Lumpur and Selangor chapter director Jian Si Lu from Malaysia arrived in Taiwan. However, upon learning of the missing jet, she quickly returned to Kuala Lumpur. With the unexpected to be more common, city volunteers have been reminded to deal with all challenges with a positive mindset. When a disaster strikes, there isn't much you can do. We can't really prepare for anything beforehand because we don't know what will happen next. Not everything will go according to our plans. To show their support for family members of passengers on the missing flight, more than 700 volunteers in Kuala Lumpur and Selangor have signed up to contribute. When people see Tiji's logo, they know that City Foundation is an internationally known charity organization. We will be sending volunteers that have experience in home visitations to the front line. Tiji volunteers are all very kind-hearted. The Malaysia Airlines only asked for 20 volunteers, but we decided to send 30 volunteers to help. In the days and weeks ahead, city volunteers will work closely with staff members of Malaysia Airlines to offer family members with much needed support and comfort. Next, we meet another Malaysia city volunteer, He Ziqing, who has since the disappearance of MH370 moved to the hotel where these families are staying to provide 24 hour service whenever needed. Always full of energy, city volunteer He Ziqing, whose medical volunteer background has been helpful in coordinating the service counter set up by Ziqi at the hotel which family members of the missing passengers are staying. I was introduced to Ziqi, so I start with the medical outreach. Mm. And I feel quite happy with that, so I continue. He retired last November after spending 30 years in the military and today has become a more soft-hearted person. In the army, we had to be tough, physically to be strong. And now, I'm still tough, but uh, because we're doing uh, volunteer work, so we had to be soft and uh, soft in the heart. Now. Since the disappearance of MH370, he Ziqing has stayed at the hotel and is always on standby, ready to travel to Beijing. First will be flight to Beijing. So I pack up my bag with my... And they say Beijing is quite cold, so I brought my cold, cold weather jacket. So that's why I had to bring a bigger bag. Come night time, the volunteer happily makes the couch his bed and seizes the opportunity to get some sleep so that he can be ready to help whenever needed. In the Philippines, following Typhoon Haiyan, the Tiji Foundation built 11 prefabricated classrooms for the University of the Philippines School of Health Science in Palo of Leyte Province. With the completion of these prefab classrooms, the school's 200 children were happy to be able to finally resume class. Walking into a space that she used to call home, this is University of the Philippines students Christine Gales, who lost all her books and belongings when Typhoon Haiyan swiped through Palo City. Everything was wet, though we saved a lot of stuff, a lot of the books were ruined. This is Mel Castillo, whose rented home was also severely damaged by the typhoon. I was very worried and tried to look for them during the typhoon. I was concerned that they didn't have food to eat. As the campus at the University of the Philippines School of Health Sciences was severely damaged by Typhoon Haiyan, students have been unable to continue with classes. Thankfully, the Tsidia Foundation arrived with prefabricated classrooms. Thank you, Tsidia Foundation, for giving us the chance to continue with our education. 
Despite the minor inconvenience that come with studying in these prefabricated classrooms, the students are more than happy to be back at school. Other than providing students with prefabs for classrooms, volunteers also thoughtfully set up temporary dorms so students can attend class free of housing worries. Following Japan's Fukushima nuclear disaster three years ago, many countries worldwide began to turn away from the use of nuclear energy. However, this hasn't affected the plan for bringing Taiwan's fourth nuclear power plant into operation. The question remains, do residents of Taiwan really need nuclear energy? Let's find out in our next report. Lin Weizhou travels around Taiwan with three types of radiation meters. This radiation meter is from Japan. This one is from the Ukraine. This is made in the U.S. This can measure theta and gamma. Last March, Lin Reiju and 40 environmentalists formed an investigation team to measure the radiation level in 1,969 locations throughout Taiwan. All major cities and counties around the island, including Taipei, Xinzhou, Taizong, Kaohsiung, Pingdong, through to Hualien and Taidong on the east, have radiation levels higher than that of Tokyo after its Fukushima disaster. I have a radiation meter with me here at the Taipei 101. A quick measurement tells us the radiation level here is over 0.2 microsievert. However, the radiation level published by the Atomic Energy Council is only half of these numbers. The different function of the equipment will give us different readings, and the numbers can be more than doubled, but that doesn't mean it is abnormal. Equipment and geological factors contribute to such differences. Is it really a measurement error, or are there other causes at work? We suspected that it is the nuclear power plant because it is currently active, and it will release radioactive substances, or it could be the nuclear waste storage facility. The storage facilities where nuclear waste is incinerated before being packed into barrels. Before the 16,000 barrels of nuclear waste produced annually in Taiwan were stored in Lanyu. It wasn't until 1996 when residents protested that Thai Power began building storage facilities within its power plants. Thai Power burns its nuclear waste, but it can be destroyed that way. More likely, it will just be released into the air. Radioactive substances are only released after a thorough filtration, so the impact caused by incinerators is very minimal. The government and the general public may have different views on radiation levels, but what is evident is the threat caused by Taiwan's three nuclear power plants. When I visited a few experts in Japan, they all told me that Taiwan is most likely to experience a nuclear disaster next. A British science magazine believes that Taiwan owns two out of three of the world's most dangerous nuclear power plants. From Fukushima, we learned that even within an 80 kilometers radius of the disaster, the area will be very contaminated. Within 30 kilometers of Japan's Fukushima plant lived only 140,000 residents, whereas in Taiwan, there are 6.5 million people living within a 30 kilometer radius of plant 1 and 2. Thus, the question is how to evacuate residents in case of an emergency. Taiwan only stretches 400 kilometers from north to south. We are not capable of withstanding even just one nuclear disaster. Nuclear energy only makes up 19% of Taiwan's total energy consumption, less than Japan's 29.2%. That means even without nuclear energy, we will have access to enough electricity if we learn to live frugally and develop renewable energy. In September 2013, two and a half years after Fukushima, all of Japan's 54 nuclear reactors have been shut down. Yet conversely, Taiwan's fourth nuclear power plant may begin operation this year. It makes us wonder, is there a chance that Taiwan will become the next Fukushima?
In Taiwan, following her initial medical assessment at the Hualien Ciji Hospital, 26-year-old Chen Tuanzi from Xiamen, China, underwent her first corrective surgery on March 12th to treat her deformed knees. Let's take a look. At the Hualien City Hospital, Chen Tuanzhi from Xiamen is ready to undergo surgery to treat her congenital knee hyperextension. Honorary Superintendent Chen Yinghe is leading the medical team that will be working to straighten Tuanzhi's right leg. Her knee is hyperextended 130 to 140 degrees. In this operation, we will cut a segment of her thigh bone to allow her leg to straighten. After a comprehensive assessment with his medical team, Chen Yinghe decided to first carry out a closed operation to straighten her leg 80 degrees before undertaking an open surgery to make another 50 degrees of correction. The most difficult part of this operation is to carry out both closed and open surgery in one go in order to reach 130 degrees of correction. Making such an enormous change on her lower body, during her operation we had to be careful not to damage her blood vessels or nervous system. Now the treatment isn't over as we need to see if her leg is able to move when she wakes up. Seeing that Chen Tuanzhi's foot can still move, Chen Yinghe feels relieved. After Tuan Zhi was moved to the recovery room, Dr. Chen rushed to inform Chen Tuan Zhi's mother of the good news. Following this first surgery, the medical team plans to carry out a second surgery to treat Chen Tuan Zhi's other leg in two weeks following. In Taiwan, as 13.2% of its population in Hualien's Yuli Township are seniors, thus the Yuli Ciji Hospital has been a firm advocate of senior health care. In 2005, the hospital started a program called Fuqi Station for Senior Citizens to encourage the elderly to get out of the house and socialize with others. <laughs> residents of Yuli Township love getting together twice a week at the Fuqi station for senior citizens to have fun with others their age. The sisters that come here are very friendly. We enjoy coming here. Solitary senior 92-year-old Zhang Yuying used to just stay at home watching TV or chant sutras and only left the house to visit the temple during the 1st and 15th of the lunar month. I didn't used to leave the house often, but my daughter told me I should come here. I think it's not bad here. Zhang's life is now full of color thanks to her participation at the Fuqi station. Each activity and each prop has been carefully designed by volunteers. And with this much effort put into each session, it's no wonder the seniors love visiting. Of course, the more frequent the gathering, the better. But in that way, the teachers will be busier as well. We are really enjoying participating. We still want to come even if it's a typhoon day. Over the past 10 years, the Yuli Ciji Hospital has insisted on running the Fuqi Station for senior citizens, even though the hospital receives no payment from Taiwan's health and welfare program for the station. Actually, the hospital doesn't need to have this senior station. However, this is part of our mission to safeguard the community and part of our responsibility for the health of senior citizens. This is why the hospital has continued this program. In Taiwan, 11% of the population is over 65 years of age. However, in Yuli Township, that number is over 13. This is why the local city hospital has placed an importance on senior citizens' health care. Maybe they won't think there is a problem with their waistline or care about the shape of their body, but it is all a reflection of a person's health. As for blood pressure, they can get a daily check here and present it to the doctors so they understand their situation better. We are not only promoting health care in the hospital, but more important is when they return home, we can continue to provide them with proper information and access. Volunteers also incorporate Siji's humanistic teachings to fulfill the spiritual needs of the seniors. With age, some seniors are not able to accept learning new things. However, if we add a personal touch to our teachings of the aphorisms, they are more likely to accept them. This is really about maintaining the health of the body, mind and spirit. That's our main goal.
Yuli Tsuji Hospital continues to work hand in hand with Tsuji volunteers to ensure the health and well being of their community. Next, we meet a recipient of this year's Melty Star program in Taiwan's Miao Li, Huang Liqing, who, despite suffering from congenital kidney disease, has made his family proud by working hard to get accepted into the National Taiwan University. Mm. No one is happier than Huang Liqing's father when Huang Liqing's name appeared on the webpage for admission into National Taiwan University's Department of Biochemical Science and Technology program. Originally, I thought he was going to be like this, but he grew up much taller than I expected. I'm happy about that. Smaller in stature as compared to others his age, the younger Huang suffers from congenital kidney disease. Li Qin's condition worsened when he reached high school, resulting in dialysis treatments until senior Huang donated a kidney to help his son. I don't want to waste time idly because life is impermanent. It can end in an instant, so I don't waste it. Having a transplant surgery forced Li Qin to take a year off from school. However, with his father's constant care and now kidney as inspiration, the younger Huang is motivated to excel in school upon his return. I want to do well in school and am inspired to work harder at it. To take better care of his son's health, Senior Huang grows his own vegetables in order to make lunch for Li Qin each day, and then bikes it to school, a trip which covers a distance of 10 kilometers. It's healthier to grow it yourself. There are no pesticides. There's no repayment necessary for a father's affection for his son. However, Li Qin plans to use his good results in school to show his gratitude and love for all his father has done for him. Also in Taiwan, to celebrate Arbor Day, the Motor Vehicles Office in Kaohsiung City encouraged members of the public to recycle used batteries by giving out trees to, to those who recycled them. Meanwhile, city volunteers gathered at the Da'ai farm to plant 600 Moringai trees and prayed for a world free of disasters. I Forty city volunteers pray sincerely for a world full of harmony while planting moringa trees. These are but some of the activities that volunteers held to celebrate Arbor Day at the Da'ai Farm in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Moringa is a multi-purpose tree. It is edible and high in nutrients. It can protect our soil, purify our air, and reduce global warming. With natural disasters becoming more common to safeguard our planet, Ziji volunteers decided to plant Moringa trees at the same time as they pray for a world free of disasters. Even today, no trees can be seen in areas that suffered from landslides during Typhoon Morakot. When these sprouts have changed into saplings, we will plant them on such hillsides. To celebrate Arbor Day, the Motor Vehicles Office in Kaohsiung will be giving a sampling to those that bring in their unused batteries. If we throw away our waste carelessly, it can pollute our environment. It is bad for our health to have these hazardous substances in our environment. As planting a tree can decrease carbon emissions by 4 to 5 kilograms a year, to safeguard our planet, all of us should learn to nurture and cherish the trees around us. In Taiwan, at this year's Eco Products International Fair held at the Taipei World Trade Center, Dye Technology was among those invited to take part in the four day event. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.